Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Today is the day the Lord has made, and we shall rejoice in it. Amen. You know why? Because He's God, He's on the throne, He's the King, and He's good. That's right. Hallelujah. He can do all things, and He can do all things well. Yes. He can do it better than us. Amen. He's better than anyone. <laughs> He's a good guy. Praise the Lord. So today, Lord, we thank you, Father, for your word. Your word is perfect, it is pure, it is true. And so today we receive it with open hearts. Because, Lord, what you can do, no man can do. No other can do. Only you can breathe life from these pages into our lives. So we thank you today for breathing life into us. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. 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 What's the Lord? So today, I may bounce around a little bit, but that's okay. I'm going to have you probably turn and primarily base ourselves out of Luke chapter 15. So I would encourage you to turn to Luke 15, even though I may give us some references and things from other places, as the Lord will lead. Amen. And so today I'm just so thankful. Oh, thankful for a wonderful day to celebrate Cam's birthday, to give thanks for Lincoln's birthday a couple days ago, and just say thank you for the increase of the family of God. You're always adding to of the increase of your kingdom, there shall be no end. Amen? And, and if I would quote that fully, the increase of his kingdom and his government, there will be no end. God's kingdom reigns. God's kingdom is what we're a part of. Even though we live our life down here, I still submit and have somebody over me. And not only natural men that I walk in accountability with, but the King of Kings and the Amen. Lord of Lords. He has my heart and what he says goes. Amen? And so I'm so thankful for that. We're not alone in this world. We have a good God that's taking care of us. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Man, I wouldn't want to live any other way. I've lived that way before. I don't want to go back. Oh, to come to know his grace, his protection, his provision, his, his encouragement. Oh my gosh, you know, why would I go back? But I know there are people that can get so disillusioned, get so far from the light that they begin to be overwhelmed by the darkness that the darkness actually looks good again. Far be it from us, Lord. Yeah. Far be it from us. Because we walk in the light and we share the light. And our fellowship is indeed with one another and sweet. Thank you, Jesus. Bless you, Lord. So today, Luke chapter 15, you know, I think, you know, if I would do just a little bit of summarization from where we were uh, last time. You know, we were uh, looking at several different messages, you know, starting with, uh, you know, the parable of the lost sheep, okay? You know, I think we had looked at that, and we'd seen how Father's heart was to leave the, 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 the 90 and 9, and so I think we could pick up with that this morning here in Luke chapter 15. You know, we can see that's the very first thing, starting in verse 4, I believe it is. So, uh, we'll go ahead and just review that very quickly here. What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, but not even the ninety and nine in the wilderness, and go after that which is lost until he finds it? And when he had found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. Now, let's just take one brief recap of that. He doesn't make it pay penance. Oh, you bad sheep, you bad sheep, and beat it all the way back home to the flock. No. That is not what he says here, does he? He says, but he takes puts it up on his shoulders. Why? So that he can relieve that lost sheep from the pain of wandering in the wilderness. And you know, I think uh, Justin and Nicole had lost their dog for a little while, Winnie. And praise the Lord, found him was it the next day? Or was it the next day? Okay. Found him the next day. And you know, even though he was still a little unsure, you know, because he had been lost, you know, he's like, he hears her voice, he knows her voice. He still didn't come maybe exactly back to him because he's just like, I'm just disillusioned. And how many times is that? You get out there, you get away from the flock, you get away from the comfort zone that you have within your life. God is taking care of you. And you get a little lost. You get, you get these question marks. Well, you know, Winnie, to make a long story short, was able to allow the love of her master to be able to coax her back into the safety of their arms. And she wasn't walking quite right, was she? She was a little sore. She was limping. You know, when you're out there on your own, you're going to get bruised up. You're going to get weary. And so will the lambs that stray away from God's flock. They will get bruised up. There is an enemy of our soul out there trying to destroy them. 
and how he first tries to destroy you is just confuse you. To get you thinking that what this world has to offer is better than what the creator of your life has got to offer for you. And, I, and you start to believe that a little bit. And so you start to partake of it. Next thing you know, you're steeped in drugs and alcohol and pornography and maybe abuse and anger. And, and you start to become a person you don't want to be. Right? That's all the enemy. That's not going to say this today. I'm not a bad person. I'm not a bad person. If you can say that today and believe that, then praise God. Because I'll tell you why. God didn't make bad things. Amen. That's right. Mm -hmm. There's an enemy of your soul that comes to make your mind become twisted. And once you become twisted, you start to do things like Paul said in Romans chapter 7. Those things I don't want to do, I do. You start to do things that are against the very nature that God wants you to be able to walk your life in Christ. So your mind becomes beat up and your body can even become abused with all of the needles, tattoos, piercings. Did anybody ask themselves, why is it this last day people, the more bizarre they can look, the better? I'm not here to preach about whether you can or can. But I want to ask you, why does people got to become more bizarre looking? No. I know Mr. Sam can tell me why. I know. Because the enemy has begun to twist us. And we don't see how subtle the vices are. They're very subtle. Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? I'm not trying to pull any legalism on you. I'm just telling you what the scripture says. But the enemy will sit there. Well, it is really your body the temple of the Holy Ghost. You know, come on. You know, you can do this. And that's his ploy. Throughout all ages, it's his ploy. It's the way he takes advantage of even Eve back in the very beginning. <laughs> Did God show the same? You're going to die and eat the fruit. Twist your mind. Amen? Yeah? Twist your mind. Many times he does it with the word. When he tempted Jesus in the wilderness, what did he do? He was trying to tempt him. The word of God. He gets you to question the validity of the truth. But Jesus was not lost. He was perfectly oriented to Father's heart. So the word was not twisted. Oh, okay, yeah, right there. Look at it that way. I never thought about that before. No. No, that's not what he did, is he? He had a perfect orientation of the word. He's like, no, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. You know, he knew how to take and keep truth straight. What's that going to do with it? Mm, a couple things. There's going to be some neat things I think the Lord will show you over the course of a service or two. And so this, this little sheep gets put up on his shoulders and he's carried back. He's not left alone. Come on. He's carried back to the fold. To the place where he's loved. A place that he's apart. A place where he enjoys safety and comfort. Not only from the shepherd, but from all the other sheep. Is that real word? The lambs. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's good sometimes to be around the sheep. It's good. I love being around. I was telling my wife she can say if I'm lying or not. Just the other day I was saying, wow, I feel, I feel alone sometimes. Because I enjoy such closeness of, of fellowship, even through the natural work of this project, with people. And it's like, I can tell, until the project's over, starting to fall back into a very slow rut. And I miss it. I miss the connection with people that I enjoyed. Did I not say that? Just you love being around the sheep sometimes. I love God too. Gotta have my own time. You gotta have your own time too. But you know, I just love when we can get together. Does that mean we gotta live together now? Does that mean we gotta be up in a building project 24-7 heavens? <laughs> and everybody's like, thank God. <laughs> but you know, there is something to be said about our fellowship with one another, our encouragement of each other's lives. And that's what I'm saying. So he comes back to the fold, and the fold receives him well. And so that's awesome. He says, I say unto you, that when he comes home, verse 6, that he calls together his friends and his neighbors, hey, rejoice with me for that which is lost, I have found. And he says, likewise, there will be joy in heaven over one sinner that repents than more than 99 just persons which need no repentance. And so we talked about that a few weeks ago, and that was, that was a good lesson to see how much we need to have Father's heart towards the lost. 
Also, we looked at another parable very, very immediately following that. We allowed the Lord to kind of challenge us a little bit, reaffirm this, this parable of the lost sheep. And it says, either in verse 8, what woman having ten pieces of silver, if she loses one piece, does not light a candle and sweep the house till she diligently finds it? Now, that, that, that piece of silver, that coin, whatever it might be, it could be a piece of silver, who knows? But whatever it is, it's not a life, is it? No, it's not a sheep. You know, I think the, the analogy of sheep is great. You know, it gives us a, an example of a life. But this here, we're looking at a thing. She loses an object. And I'll tell you what God wants you to see about this. He wants you to see not so much it's a piece of silver or gold or if it's a piece of property. He wants you to see that it is something of value. It is something that just cannot, should not, and would not, if you were a reasonable person, be discarded. That's what he's getting you to see. That's why he ties this analogy right after the parable of the sheep. That people, whether they know Christ or not, are not something for us to disregard. They are of extreme value. And we need to see them the way the Lord sees them. As I will start to sweep up the whole house, I'll take my light, hello, we have the candle of the Lord, and I will begin to look. And if we haven't found that burden yet, God help us. Please, Lord, help us to see people the way you see them, with the value that they have. You and I were once lost. We're thankful we're saved. Do you know how much value we are? We're extremely valuable, and so is every person that has not come to know Christ yet. And until we sense the value of a person, we're not ready to start putting away my agenda and starting to sweep the house and start to get the light out and start to look under furniture and go to the highways and byways and the crevices of life to be able to find folks. Because we're not seeing them with the value that we're supposed to. Are we? Amen. And so I want you to, to know that that's what he's bringing here to us. He's bringing chapter 15, verses 8 through 10. The value of our lives. So that when she finds it in verse 9, she finds that which is lost. She's rejoicing to the point that she says to her neighbors, Hey, friends and neighbors, I have found that which was lost. Come and rejoice with me. In verse 10 again, Jesus reaffirms. Likewise, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God who the one set of their repentance. So those two analogies are very beautiful. Very wonderful. Speaking to how precious our life is. How wounded we may get. But God is there to care and comfort and bring us back to the flock, to the fold, to the folks that can encourage our lives as we keep our eyes on the Lord together. And also the value of your life. The value of, I cannot dismiss that it isn't something that God would want me to do to come away from my agenda. To start to look and seek out that which has been lost. God has placed people in our lives that only we can reach. You know, we're always hoping that God will bring another person across the path. What about us? Right? What about us? And so it's so important to allow that to be established in your heart. God needs to establish that in our Not me. Not this teaching. But God establishing the value of life. So today I want to wrap up with this next parable that Jesus brings. In case those two didn't sink in. The great teacher that I am, right? Teacher just keeps teaching and teaching and teaching. <laughs> I heard it, Pastor. I heard it. Well, good, do it. Don't just hear it. Do it. Right? James says that we're deceived when we just hear the word and don't do it. So Jesus says this in Luke chapter 15 and continuing on now from verse 11 through the end of the chapter. He brings out another very pertinent analogy and parable regarding this whole value of life and the need for us to, to go out out of our comfort zones, to leave the 99, to leave our agendas, to seek out that which is lost. He said in verse 11, a certain man had two sons. Now the first thing I'm going to tell you is that nobody thinks alike. He had two sons, and I guarantee you each son, because you know everybody, had a different opinion of what life was about. We're not here to debate about what life is and isn't about. God tells us what it's about. You either get a clue or you don't. So each person will find themselves wanting to conduct and operate your life based on their own viewpoint. Well, this is what I think life's about. You know, I might go to church once or twice a year. Christmas and Easter. That's fine. God's given me the rest of my life to go do my own thing. And you're certainly entitled to live that way. God is not here to dictate how you live. But then there's another person that might find, 
No, I, God's did everything for me. I owe him my life. Yeah. And that person, I'm going to use it. I'm going to take the pendulum completely the other way, okay? I'm not trying to give you there's a right or wrong with this. I'm going to say, so far over here that the, the pendulum swings at, you know, I don't do anything but what God wants me to do. I need to do everything that God wants me to do. And so I'm caught up in all of the things that I think I need to do to please God. <laughs> to the degree is a parable of Schultz that I miss God's heart. So I'm not trying to point out right and wrong here. Whether you choose to, to live a life that feels I can go out and do my own thing, so my Bible looks, or whether or not I need to serve God to the letter of the law, to the T, of exactly what I feel He wants for me so that I can be right in sight. Each one of those individuals didn't know God's heart. That's not God's heart. Christ has paid the price once and for all to redeem us and to give us life again. That life is not a life that is bound but free. It is not bound by thou shalt touch not, taste not, do this, don't do this. It's not bound by that. It's, it's so free that God gives you the opportunity to find out what's important about it. That's how free God has made you. That you would come to find beyond everything, sowing my vows or serving by the letter of this law, the most important thing is that I came to know my Father's heart. I, I really don't care if I've forgotten to do something like my morning prayer this morning. I, I, Lord, I need your heart today. I, I, and in that, maybe I'm praying, but it isn't a formal prayer. It isn't I have done my Hail Mary, I have done my, you know, uh, Our Fathers, and I'm not against those, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying, the heart that cries out and longs after God of the inside, yeah. my heart panted after thee. It's like a deer panted for the water. Knowing what life was really about was that intimacy with Father, because we were created for this. That in the cool of the day, God would walk with Adam, his voice would walk with them in fellowship, and if we never come to that reality, that's what life's all about. Having fellowship with God, you've missed life. He's created us so free that that's what, he, that's what he wants you to find. It's all about knowing his voice. It's all about hearing his voice. It's all about being able to say, thank you, Lord, for the beautiful day that you've given us and the ability to fellowship with friends and to be able to enjoy your presence because the devil ain't here. Because we praise your holy name. He's coming to establish his kingdom. I don't have to worry about somebody thieving on me right now. Somebody trying to take my stuff. Somebody talking bad about me. No, God's presence is in here. And when God's presence is with us, his kingdom is established and we rejoice and we're comfortable. And we're at peace. Are we not? If you said you're tormented, there would be a reason why you're tormented. It ain't God. That's right. Because there's something in you that doesn't want to be in the presence of God. And so I pray that that's not what you're experiencing today. Because God is good, amen? amen? Come to give us life. So there's going to be varying views on life. And we need to, as a church, those that have found what the purpose of life is, those that are operating in that presence of mind, of knowing Father's heart, I'll tell you what, you need to allow people to have and experience that. You can't beat them up about it. Even about law, this is what you got to do. God will reveal that even to them. But they need to see it. They need to see an operation. They need to see what a life that is not regulated by religion, nor just abandoning all responsibility in sowing my wild oats, is all about. They need to see a purity of relationship that you have with God that, that basically it's a love of Christ that constrains me. It's my love for Him that allows me to do or not do things. It's because in Him I live, I move, I have my being. And and when I know I'm walking in love with God and with his people, my life takes on the form and the expression it's supposed to take. It ain't about my job no more. It ain't about what I want to do to please him. It ain't about what I want to do to please myself. It's a totally different life. And people have to see it. That's why Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. He knew how to be a base. He knew how to abound. He knew how to live in both places, peace. He knew what it was all about. But he says, follow me as I follow Christ. Because you're going to find there's something greater in operation than him just being a Pharisee that knew the law, the way of God. And there'd be something more than just celebrating the freedom of Christ to the place that lasciviousness, 
you know, license to sin is coming in, you know, denying God's grace, trampling on the blood of Christ's flesh. He knew how to live by the Spirit. And to allow himself to be a base or a bound, whatever God wanted, that he might be the person you're supposed to be, that hopefully others can see, wow, there's a life in Christ I never saw before. There's a freedom I never experienced, could even consider. Oh, we saw you had to go and do this, this is what got you in favor with God. No. Heavens know there's many people, just like you find out, many people are going to be missing God's heart. And so I'll just move through this parable a little bit more for you. In verse 12, the younger said to his father, Give me a portion of goods that falleth to me. He wasn't afraid to ask his father for the inheritance. Give me a portion of goods that falleth to me. And, and he divided it unto them. His living, God did. The father did. Now I'll tell you what, you know, this person's view was like, you know, I'm not struggling with God giving you. I'm taking it and I'm going with it. I'm going to run with it. But the way I choose to run with it matters. Today, just like you can be here today, you can come and say, I'm here to worship God. But how you choose to take what God gives you and use it matters. And so this young man, he wanted what was rightfully his. As much as even the elder son, he wanted you know, what's rightfully his. He's serving his father because he knows what the father has is his. And Jesus says, all that the father has is mine. Jesus knew that too. So here we see that this young man, he had his resources and giftings and talents and all that given to him, and he just chose to go out and live his life the way he wanted to live his life. Again, the other side of that penalty, way over here. He just chose without any regard for how he should live his life by a different motive, the love that the Father has. He lived his life, and, it, and you know that what he did is he lived wastefully. This is called doing your own thing. And I want to bring up something to you because I've been doing studies out of the uh, book of Revelation. Jesus wrote to the seven churches. Why did he write to the seven churches? Just give you some nuggets. Because the seven churches were a representation of who Jesus is. So he wrote to the seven churches, and he commended or he upgraded them a little bit based on what was happening, their expression of him to this earth. When you start to look at it from that light, you'll get a whole lot more out of those, those two chapters, Revelation 2 and 3. He was writing about how they were representing him. They loved him. They were all Christians. They all believed. They all washed the blood. But what they were choosing to do with that life was making a difference in the way that people perceived Christ, who he is, what I allowed. All right? And so this young man, he reminds me of the church of Pergamos, which was a, a, a church without any regard for pure doctrine. You know, the, my, my uh, Thompson chain reference Bible says they're a her, heretic, heretical, heretical, they're heretics. In other words, what that means is they weren't allowing anybody to go. Teach you to go. So it's okay, I have a little bit of doctrine of God here on this, you know, maybe I'll celebrate the, the last supper, you know, the communion table of the Lord, but also, you know, we're going to celebrate, you know, offering up our, our children to fail, you know, which I think some of the scriptures are. It, they just, it was like anybody that wanted to come and teach something came in and taught it, and the church, the governance of the church in Christ was not restricting it. And so now it's in the notes. Any teaching went. And so Jesus upgraded them. He was not happy with that. And I see that about us that want to run our own life. I'm talking to Christians now. I'm not talking to the world. The world does what the world does best. They go out and sin. Why? They don't know any difference. But to the Christian that ought to know better, when I choose to go out here and do it any old way I want, oh, I'll take a little of this, I'll take a little of that. Now my Bible tells me that tithe was before, during, and after Christ. You know, whole other message not here to talk about that. But those of you who want to struggle with that, you struggle with the word. You don't struggle with that. The word teaches tithe before, during, and after Christ. So, and I want you that I don't want that. Okay? So I got to use something really real so that you guys know I'm not just talking about hot air here. Oh, you know what? But it don't matter what I watch. You know what I'm saying? I can go ahead and watch this and watch that. Maybe I just go watch the R-rated shows or, or who knows? Maybe I'll even get online and visit sites I shouldn't go to. It don't matter. Isn't that just as bad as the doctrine of Baal? I might as well be sacrificing my children up because you can have a generational curse. You don't pass that stuff right on your children. Amen. It's like, 
you know, we, we think anything goes, and that's exactly what this young man did. And that's why I want to liken it to the Church of Pergamos, because it's not just an individual. It's talk, he's talking about people, people and their views. And when you think you don't need to listen to what God says, and you can just do it your own way, you're going to end up a shipwreck just like this young man did. You don't think he didn't end up shipwrecked. The Bible says, for whatsoever you sow, that shall you also reap. Amen. You sow to the flesh, you shall reap corruption. But if you shall sow to the Spirit, you shall reap life everlasting. Amen? So it's very important what we do with things. Very important. And so he went out and did his own thing. Verse 12. Not many days after the younger son had gathered all together and took his journey into a far country, and there wasted his substance with righteous living. Righteous. Righteous. No. Righteous. Righteous. Very similar words, aren't they? Righteous? <laughs> right living and righteous. Righteous. <laughs> Say a little sort. Riotous. <laughs> righteous. It's saved living versus unsavedness. Unsaved living. Unsavory. That's what it was. Unsavory. Yeah, unsavory. Very good. <laughs> I'll tell you what that what happens when you're living according to your own rules. And you're living riotous. Unsaved, you're living without regard to good doctrine. It can lead you to the expression of Christ that the church of Sardis had. They had a name that they were alive, but they were dead. They were the dying church. Why was the church of Sardis dying? Because people were defiling themselves. How do I know that? Because he says, you still have a few that aren't defiling themselves. They're worthy to walk with me in white. That's how I know what the church of Sardis was doing. They were defiling themselves. They were going out there thinking, it don't matter if I partake of this and I partake of that and I do this and I do that. It doesn't matter. And guess what? They were defiling themselves. And it was causing them to die in Christ as his expressions in the earth. So I wrote down a little note. thought it was kind of interesting. You know, if you're not going to be careful about where you live, it can produce certain things in you. So I wrote down that you got to be careful that you're not just so quick to succumb to the Pergamos, the church experience of Pergamos, where anything goes, because it can lead to the expression of Sardis down in your Christianity. And don't you think that you've ever found a believer that isn't so hopeless right now? They think, oh, I've been there, I've done that. They're so bitter in their heart because they went the way of doing it their own way, and they defiled themselves to a degree. They ain't got no hope no more, and they don't want to hear you talk about hope in Christ no more. They didn't even give up on that his, his blood will forgive them. Christians that get so defeated, they're willing to walk away from it all because I tried that. No, you didn't. You really tried it and come to know it. Father, you'd still be there. But you didn't come to know it. What you thought, you thought you had an expression of God going in your life, but you didn't. Because to know him is to love him. So I, you know, I know it's tough. It's tough to approach people that have been there, done that, and don't want to hear a word about it. Because the devil gets them so boxed in. He gets them so trapped in their mind, they will not listen no more. And that's exactly what the devil wants to do. He wants to defeat the thinking. He wants to defeat you so bad that you can never have hope that there's a God that loves you. That there's a God that would save you from even the worst things you've ever done in your life. He, he wants to totally destroy you. And when you buy into the lie, guess what? It's over. Yeah. Unless God peradventure will give you the repentance under the acknowledgement of the truth. Paul told Timothy. You know, you've got to come to a point where you acknowledge truth again. You've got to love God's truth. His truth is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Yeah. He is not changing. That's right. God loves us. His blood has been shed once and for all. Jesus. And just because the enemy can tell you that you're not worthy no more, that you're not worth it, that you've taken and you've went too far, you need to just trust God, get on your knees and trust God. Say, God, I didn't know your heart. Yeah. You've got to trust me. You are sure. How do I know that? Look at the end of this story. You're going to see the same thing. He'd come back and run an act of the pride of the son. And so, you know, I want to make sure that we don't allow ourselves to experience those types of things. So in verse 14, he spent all, and there was a mighty famine in land, and he began to be in want. That speaks of stewardship versus self-absorbedness. Ephesus, Smyrna, and Philadelphia cared for the things of God. Ephesus loved everything about God, held to it. 
but yet they had something against them. They had left the first love. They had forgot how to love humanity. I want to pull people out. I want to pull them out of private school. I want to get away. Oh, gosh, keep my family away from this. Keep them. Shut up all the TVs. Shut up all the cell phones. Don't you ever watch the news? I'm isolating myself. You're forgetting how to love people that still need you. That's a spirit that creeps in and it's crept into Ephesus and they got rebuked. He says, I can appreciate you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. I can appreciate that you're holding a pure doctrine, that you're celebrating the truth the way you should celebrate it, but you love your first love. Your first love is to love me and to love your man, love your neighbor. That's what they got rebuked for. We can't allow ourselves to go there, church. Yeah, I gotta make a big deal about it. Because how many times do I have people want to try to pull people away from the world? No. What you got, they can't take. You just gotta learn how to stand up until the Bible says fight the good fight of faith. You just gotta learn how to trust that God can get you through. He says, I'll never let you be tempted above that which you're able. Now, if you want to go out there and start partying with them and go to the bars and start to do the drugs with them, and then, oh yeah, you're going to have a rough time. You ought to know a little bit better than to do that. Don't give yourself to their sin, but don't shy away from being the light that God has called you to be. Know who you are. Hey, I used to do that, but you know, i got just a different heart about that. I don't feel like doing that stuff. Well, hey, well, hey, you just might hear me talk about some things that maybe you haven't heard me talk about before. Don't go blown away with truth. Don't try to be mad. But just be the person that God's called you to be. You'll start to find a hole and drop like flocks. You won't be running away. They'll be running away. Right. Because what fellowship has light with darkness? When the light shines, darkness comprehends not. Gospel of John chapter 1. Yep. And it flees. Yeah. You don't got to try to worry about staying safe. Jesus will make sure that happens all by itself. Right. Isn't that a repositioning of your mind on the way you look at things? If you live for God the way you're supposed to live, trust me, all the evil will flee. They don't want any of God's life. How backwards do we get it when we start to run from the darkness? God forbid, help us, Lord. It's the last days. The world needs us. He's waiting on us to do our job. Verse 15, he even joined himself to a citizen of that country, and, and that citizen sent him into his fields to feed his swine. You know, you've got to be careful. When you're living according to your own rules, you're making unholy alliances. You're getting unequally yoked. You have controlling influences over you. So when your heart would want to do certain things, it can't because you feel that you've got to obey another master. That's all i got to say about that. Verse 16 says, He would have fain have filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. First of all, let me say this, because man outside of Christ is merciless. He's ruthless. He'll kill you rather than help you. He'll leave you to die. He don't care if you're starving. That's why we got famines and people dying all over the world. The governments don't care. They ain't worried about trying to mobilize the resources they got to give us through the people that we can supply to their needs. So they just let them die by the groves, by the thousands, by the millions in these famines. It's been happening all the life, folks. There's also been genocide going with our little babies. The pro-lifer, or not the pro-lifers, but the, uh, what do you call that? The, uh, Planned Parenthood, yeah. They're out there just slaughtering a generation, unchecked, unchallenged. Don't you challenge that. The Supreme Court said it's okay. Who the fuck was the Supreme Court? They ain't God. That's right. But yet, we as Christians, if we allow the voice to talk to us, it starts to take our values down. We start, we won't take a stand for that anymore. Says who? God has called us to stand up for the truth of who we are in Him. He loves us. He loves every little child that's coming in. That's why every little child that comes into this, this earth that, bear, that breaks the, you know, the water from the womb is going to heaven if it dies before it reaches the age of understanding. Being able to make a choice to live for God or not to live for God. That's how great God's love is. Every little child. It's covered by His grace. But what happens when you start to have holy alliances and you're joined to people that have controlling influences is you remove yourself from the umbrella of God's grace in your life. Now God can't even take care of you. Because the devil's got you wherever he wants you. You're a little puppet. You're a little pawn. Like a marionette with the strings. You know what I'm saying? He's got you doing exactly what you're doing. You're outside of God's grace. 
I gotta say, I'm thankful to God that it got me outside, you know, of, of the devil's control so many years ago that I almost forget what it's like to be in that place where people can have controlling influence in your life. But it's real. I know it's real. I've been there when I was younger. But I'm just so thankful now. Praise God to be free in Christ Jesus. To be able to live for God and to be able to live according to the convictions that He set within my heart. Not to tell people what to do and not do. You, you, you ever hear me say that? I'm not trying to tell you what to do and not do. I'm telling you who to love. I'm telling you about the love of the Father. You don't love the Father and I go home. Because if you love the Father, He'll take you home. He'll put you up on his shoulders. He'll carry you back home. Amen. Verse 17, you know, this young man finally come to himself after he find himself starving to death and there's no grace on his life. No man's feeding him. And he says, oh my gosh, how many of my, my father's hired servants have bread enough to spare and I perish with hunger. You know, his eyes were becoming unveiled. You know, that which had prevented him from seeing the goodness of his father was starting to come. It's like, wow, even my father takes care of even his servants. And they have more than enough to spare. It's like, oh, duh. Finally starting to see how good God really is. And he comes to himself and he goes, I'm going to go back home. I'm going to go back home. You know, the first thing I want to say about that too, what he realized is he's, he's seen God's nature. We take God for granted when we're just worried about our own thing, doing it our own way. We take him for granted and we don't understand his nature. That's why we miss his heart. So we don't come to know his heart. But when he came to himself, he began to acknowledge God's goodness, his nature. My father cares. He cares so much that even the servants got extra. And that's something that we have to all realize is who he is. And what his heart is. It's not about the big things you can do for him. It's about whether or not you come to know him. That would dictate the things that you do in your life. Praise God. People don't flock to an austere God. But they come running and they surrender to a compassionate and healing and loving God. Because he can take care of them. So don't, please, Christian, fellow believer, don't present God as a hard and austere, judgmental God. People will never come to Him that way. That's right. He that hath ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. I don't want to hear the one verse that says, save my fire, because I believe you're taking it out of context. God is not here to scare the hell out of you. He's here to see who He is. Because all of creation bows and surrenders and worships Him. That is, that always will be. We cannot put fear in people's heart about who He is. If they come to see the God that He is in your life, they will follow you. So there's no way they can point a finger except to me. If they will see the God that He is to me, they will follow Him. Because I will not Pick up the stone and throw it. I will be there like Jesus. Oh God, help them see. This is not about what they're doing. It's about who you are. This is about them coming to know you, God. This is about knowing that you're going to give everything, even my life, on the cross as a payment once and for all. And I know that the enemy has got their mind completely so blind. And Lord, help them get away from trying to kill each other. Because that's what they want to do. Man wants to kill each other in the church if it's not careful. Does the same thing when the first ones will pick up stones and start throwing them at the abortionists, at the homosexuals, at everybody that starts to become an issue to the church. We don't have his heart. And I can preach that from the mountaintop because God did not do that. Jesus did not do that. He did not do that. He allowed his love for humanity to override. The judgment, because the judgment's coming, folks. The seals are being broken. I'm not preaching about that today, but the seals are being broken. So judgment is about ready to happen. The final great day of the Lord is about to happen. And when it happens, all of creation has nowhere to go. We better have presented the God, our Father, in Jesus Christ, the best way possible that people have a hope to follow. We will give account for every idle word. We'll give account for every judgment. 
I don't care how self-righteous we think we are. We've got the truth out of you and God Father's heart on it. Oh, it's scary, guys. I say that because when I was a young man, I was quick to cut. But I've matured, and I've put away the childish things. And God has shown me his heart. And now all I want to do is share his heart. He loves you. He loves you. He knows you're bound. He knows you're caught up in things. He knows that you've got anger, that you've got resentments, that you've got brokenness. He knows what's going on, church, but he loves you. Amen. And he can heal you. And he can bring you back home. He can help you live a life that he's given to you that will be one full of faith, full of over overcoming power. This is the way we overcome the world, even by our faith, my faith in that God loves me so much, he will not let me die. He will not let my foot slip. When I talk God, second death, he will not let me slip away from him. Nothing can pluck, pluck me out of the Father's hand. God is good, and we have to be reoriented to that today. We can never accomplish the mission if we don't have Father's heart. Why? Can you say that, Pastor? Because I saw what the other son did. The other son, when you come in the house, you got to question yourself. Forget the notes. Why did the other son, why was he on the field? Why was he not in the house with the rest of the family when they were having the party? Why was he in the field and he didn't know what was going on in the father's house? What is this that I hear? What's going on? You got to question yourself for that. Because that man was so busy about doing what he thought was right for God, he didn't know father's heart. He was busy trying to do for God what he felt God needed to be done versus living with God and enjoying all that he had. Look at that. Hey, get for me, Lord. Well, you might come home a little bit. You might be in the house with the family. You might enjoy some life like that. Good Lord. So, you know, I just got to go where the Holy Spirit takes me on that. The young man, when he come back, the father saw him far off and he come running. The father came running. He didn't wait for him to come back and grovel and say, you know, I've ticked you off. You know, I've spent everything you give me. I, I've really messed up, you know. I've made a shambles of myself. Look at it, I don't even look right anymore. I got tit, tats, and, you know, whatever they call those things here. I got stuff happening everywhere, my Lord. Yeah. No, he didn't make him come crawling back. The Father ran to him. The Father let his love for who we are supersede everything about what was going on. He's about, hey, 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 he's coming back home. He's coming back home. That was Father's heart. There was nothing that was going to keep him back. And by the way, you guys try to get out the best road possible and get the ring, man. Give it over to the rest of the family. Russ family's like, yeah, that's cool. Find the best one. Here, let's find the best one we can. This is the best one. You don't rush it. You don't get that ring. Get that ring. Get that ring. Get ready. Father, come back. Look, there's somebody out there. Oh man, they're hungry. Sweet, sweet. This is a good party. This is a good party. Let them come back. You know, people in the family knew it was going on. They knew it was hard. They knew it was on. Man, you better kill the fatty cat. We got it. Don't worry about it. This is the best one. Biggest one, man. You can like this. You know, we got some big coming tonight. You know. <laughs> okay, she got on the same to be a part of. To know God. To know his heart. Bless the Lord. It's such an exciting place. It's life. Yeah. Ain't nobody going to dictate that to me or you. You know what I mean? Nobody can tell you how to live that. you got to have it because you know who he is. you got to know Father's heart. And so Father wanted him to get all those things prepared. He wanted all those things prepared. Because when that young man came back, it wasn't about him paying a price. It was about his love for us and that Jesus. His love for us allows us to go out so our bodies. It allows us to go and become just as religious and turn off as I could possibly be. That's how much he loves me. But people, whether you're on one side of the Bible or the other or somewhere in between, please know where God's heart is. That's where he wants us to live. Where we can enjoy life together. We have that proper value on people. We know that when we start to see it, oh man, I was talking to him yesterday, I'm job. And I think, like, it, it asks a question, you know, it depends with the Holy Spirit. You know what I'm saying? I have talked a little bit, you know. And, 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 and I talked to you, you know, where some kind of doesn't want to come to us as all. But you know what? The Lord, Lord, because if you do, I'll walk through it again. I'll walk through it again, brother. That's the application we're talking about. The one I have to wash you, keeping them lifted up before the Lord. Father, you'll be there to speak. I don't even know what I got to talk about. I don't matter what I got to talk about. I just talk about you because I love you. He gives you the words to speak. 
Like I said, you know, I'm talking about Moses in the desert in the you know, part of the Sea. Who knows what's going on? It doesn't matter. God will use it because he's knitting your heart. He's taking and sharing his heart through you. And when they begin to see that there's a father that loves them, that can trust, they, they can trust. Man, this person ain't here beating on me. He ain't here belittling me. He ain't here trying to get anything from me. You know, man, this, I, I like this guy. I like this guy. This guy. I like being around him. That's cool. What's that doing? He's knit. What's the father doing always? He's knit. He's knit up so close that nothing can ever separate us from him in the love of Christ. Nothing. And that's our mission. That's our job. It's the great commission. None of us should fall short of it. But we've got to see people for who they are. They are, they are the lost sheep. They are the most valuable thing that without any reason at all, I should stop what I'm doing and try to make sure I find that piece of valuable that's been lost. And you know what God's telling on your heart to pray for somebody, to work with somebody. You know that. You don't need anybody else to tell you. The Holy Spirit, he, he unctions your heart. You know that. So rather than say a bunch more, I think I said enough. Got some good notes, but that's okay. God uses notes just to kind of get his point going. <laughs> we got to know how to enjoy life. We, we got to know where life is within. It's not in the ritual or the requirement. And it's not in the doing your own thing. I want to say somewhere in between, but you know what? If you come to that somewhere in between and you don't have him, you still miss it. <laughs> it's all about him. He loves us so much. Jesus loves us so much. He has come to give us life and life more abundantly. He has come to encourage your heart today. He's come to help you understand the value of life that you won't take for granted anymore. We're all children growing up. We're all children maturing day by day. Coming to know one thing. My God so loves me. Wow. And I know if he so loves me, he strengthens me. I've got some hope to give to somebody else. I've got something to offer. I don't have to offer it, but I've got something. And I want it to overflow. I want it to bubble out of my life. I don't want it to be something I've got to contrive and try to think about. I don't want to tell somebody about this God that has to do this. You know? I want to be that person that has the life in them. Oh, Lord, we thank you, Jesus. I thank you for all the precious realities. Lord, there's even more that we could pull from that, but, you know, another day. You speak to us, Lord, today about what's most important, the value of life, Lord. That we would start to put away our agendas, the way we do life, that we might do life the way you call us to do life, Lord. We thank you, Lord. It isn't about the big things. It's about the little things. The little thing of just knowing you, being able to love you, to enjoy you. To know that all is well with our soul, that we don't have to jump through huge hoops or even little hoops, Lord. We just have to be there for you. I know when it comes to prayer, Lord, you're always there. You're, you're just wondering how we show up. <laughs> so, Lord, I pray, Father, we find ways of intimacy, Lord, that we're there. We're not missing our time of prayer, whether it's in the car, whether it's in our prayer closets, Lord, whether it's in the evening, before bed, wherever it might be, at the prayer table. Lord, let us be there. Be there with our hearts, not with our agendas, with our hearts. Not to speak forth lots of words, but Lord, maybe you should speak forth a few words. Father, I thank you, Lord, I love you. And hear from you. Well, Lord, what an anointed prayer that is, Lord. I would rather hear from you than hear the words that I got to say out of my mouth. All I can do is lift up my cares, cast my cares on the Lord, and ask, Lord, that you would continue to fulfill your will, that you would help others come to know you. So, Lord, our prayers aren't big. They're not long. Not about what we know. Father, it's about you. We love you. We thank you today. In Jesus' name, we pray. We will bless that. Amen. Amen.